Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. So if you wouldn't mind taking your seats. Um, I am really pleased to be here. My name is Renee White. I am provost and executive vice president for academic affairs here at the New School. And it really is a pleasure to have the opportunity to welcome you. So we are really glad that you are here to do the work that's so important um, and to participate in this morning's event. I do also want to make sure to thank our master of ceremonies, Josh Soren, so thank you, um, to our distinguished panelists, and to all of my colleagues here today who have worked to organize this important presentation and discussion, especially Professor Tymon McPherson and Associate Director Christopher Kennedy from the Urban Systems Lab, as well as our partners at Google.org, the Center for Public Impact, and World Resources Institute. We have all directly experienced in various ways the impacts of climate change, which are increasingly real and visible in our daily lives. This is especially true in cities like New York, where we're wrestling with extreme heat and rainfall, smoke from wildfires, sea level rise, and coastal, coastal flooding. Simultaneously, Technologies like AI are rapidly transforming how we interact with the world around us in profound ways. Amidst concerns about its power, is there room for great hope in AI as a tool for protecting cities and communities from climate disaster and also addressing the ongoing climate crisis? So to address this question, we're excited today to convene senior leaders from across public, private, and social sectors to discuss showcased AI solutions that could very well reimagine the immediate future of climate resilience in cities. And I just want to add, I um, had a conversation yesterday with a, a, a friend and colleague of mine who does a lot of different kinds of work and publishing, and he was actually talking about the ways in which so many different industries have to harness their shared talent and knowledge um, and ability to communicate um, and, and reimagine what solutions could be and to really sort of provide um, spaces of opportunity, not only for us, but uh, obviously for our future generations. So this morning, we will welcome demonstrations of two novel AI climate resilience solutions. Climate IQ, presented by the New School's Urban Systems Lab, and data for cool cities presented by the World Resources Institute. And on behalf of the new school, I would like to take this opportunity to provide our thanks to google.org for their generous award of $5 million to advance the Urban System Lab's climate IQ effort, which we hope will spur continued research and faculty student engagement around the critical issues of climate change and emergent technologies. So following these demonstrations, we will have the opportunity to listen in on perspectives from our impressive panelists on the implications of governance and technology for climate resilience. This panel will be moderated by Joel Towers, Professor of Architecture and Sustainable Design in the School of Constructed Environments at Parsons School of Design, as well as a new school university professor and also co-director of the Tishman Environment and Design Center, what we call TEDC. We then hope you will join us after the panel for a networking event with Coffee and Light Fair just outside the auditorium. So in close, I just want to say that the new school is deeply committed to collaborative and interdisciplinary research and scholarship to address climate and environmental justice issues. From the work of our centers, including the Urban Systems Lab and Tishman Management at the Milano School of Policy, Management, and Environment in the Schools of Public Engagement, to our undergraduate program in environmental studies housed in both the schools of public engagement and also Eugene Lang College of Liberal Arts, to the work being done on sustainable fashion practices at Parsons. And as provost, I am so proud and, and feel so lucky to get to be in a space where all of this incredible work is happening. And I'm inspired by the faculty, the staff, the students who are so clearly deeply committed to really advancing um, sort of justice principles and to really come up with solutions that are not just actionable, but are also sustainable and that can be replicated. 
So collectively, the New School and its colleges are proud to challenge convention through courage, creativity, and cooperation. Projects and conversations like this are central to our mission of generating positive change for the future. So it is our pleasure, and it really is my pleasure, to have you all here to participate in this discussion. So thank you again for joining us. And I'm going to pass it off now to Josh Soren. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's give another round of applause to Dr. White for those great opening remarks. So my name is Josh Soren. I work for the Center for Public Impact. We're a global nonprofit that was founded by the Boston Consulting Group. And we're one of the partners that are thrilled to host this event and just wanna thank you all for, for joining today. To date, CPI has worked with over 200 local governments across the world with a mission to improve their capacity to solve complex problems. In my role, I lead our global portfolio of climate work across the world with the goal of increasing the speed and scale of climate action uh, across the world. Our organization was founded on this understanding that the challenges that governments face today in the 21st century are of a very different nature than the challenges governments face in the 20th century when their systems, structures, and processes were set up for. And so to address these complex challenges, especially those associated with climate mitigation and adaptation, we think about how can we increase the speed and scale at which they're learning and improving on the, on the work that they're doing. So not just following the traditional process of analyzing, planning, and delivering, but really viewing experimentation and learning as a core way of the work, the core part of the, the work that they do. And this is why I'm so excited for today's event and also why CPI was honored to support the Google.org Impact Challenge on Climate Innovation, which committed $30 million to fund big bet projects that accelerate technological advances in climate information and action. In just a minute, we're going to kick things off with some opening remarks from Dr. Mahmoud Mohildin, the UN Climate Change High Level Champion for COP27, and also the UN Special Envoy on Financing for the 2030 Development Agenda. As Dr. White said, following that, we're going to see two showcase pr presentations of, of solutions that were two of the winners from the Google.org Google Impact Challenge on Climate Innovation. The first will be from the New Schools Urban Systems Lab, and the second will be from WRI. Following these showcase presentations, we'll have a panel of experts who will discuss the opportunities and challenges of leveraging technologies like artificial intelligence to accelerate climate action. Following that panel, we'll also have a Q&A, so please do get your questions ready throughout the, the panel. And then as Dr. White said, following that, we'll have uh, some networking afterwards, we'll get to connect with each other. So with that, I'm very pleased to hand it over to Dr. Mahmoud Mohildin to give us some opening remarks. Thank you. Please help me in welcoming him to the stage. Well, thank you so much for uh, the kind introduction and the opportunity to um, discuss with you um, issues related to climate change, sustainable um, uh, development, and uh, raise more questions perhaps than giving hints uh, to answer. So I'll be speaking on uh, AI, HS, and NAP, to be explained. Um, so AI, the artificial intelligence and its implications. HS is uh, human stupidity that resulted in the mess that we're in, in climate and sustainable development goals. And NAP is my own acronym for no acronyms, please, especially if you are addressing wide, broad of audience who are not familiar necessarily with the jargon that you are using. Um, because I feel after getting exposed to uh, some of the recent discussions about artificial intelligence, their policies, regulations, that's not just a matter for the top professionals working in their labs and their uh, silos, as they should, but it's basically an issue of concern for everybody now on the planet. Um, and uh, before I proceed, I'd like to uh, um, acknowledge um, the, uh, the sponsors and the, um, uh, the partners in this important work, including um, uh, Google.org, which I started my week in New York by um, attending many of their sessions. 
uh, focusing on localized solutions based on adaptation and resilience in many developing economies, including from South Asia and, um, and Africa. I'd like to recognize as well the work of WRI, and they have been very much involved with us as partners in the climate change and assessment of progress or lack of progress. Um, CPI has been already introduced with its uh, good impact in our work. And of course, the new uh, school. And this is my first time in person to be in the new school, but um, um, I have many uh, good friends as professors, um, old researchers and graduates from the school. And as I was uh, sharing with one of some of your professors before this session, um, I graduated from um, a university called uh, Warwick University in the UK. And this is a university that uh, is known to be um, uh, Mrs. Margaret Thatcher's favorite university. So you can really expect the kind of interesting discussions and debate from a graduate of Warwick and a graduate of uh, New School. But this kind of uh, uh, free exchange um, of different views makes matter more exciting than what, when you talk to people who are from the same uh, school or same ideology. But, um, let me just outline to you the kind of landscape that we are trying to uh, uh, discover and where exactly issues related to uh, settlements um, come into that bigger context of methods. We had a very big fight for almost two years to prove to everybody who's participating in what's so called climate action, trying to apply the Paris Agreement in its different areas of work in mitigation, adaptation, resilience. Now, some decent work is happening in loss and damage, and of course finance, that climate action is part of the sustainable development goals, not just by the definition and the construction of the sustainable development goals, but basically in every kind of work that we are trying to do in the Paris Agreement uh, and its different components in mitigation or adaptation, you are touching positively or negatively something related to the SDGs. Um, energy and energy efficiency and access to energy and dealing with renewables is one of the core um, goals and targets of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is SDG 7. Um, adaptation, which we are, you are discussing today, a part of the adaptation agenda, has been neglected for many years with a false and generous assumption that the world is going to be doing a fantastic job in mitigation and reducing the emissions. But, and that was neglected. Um, it was bypassed even in the discussions until I would say during the Sharm el Sheikh uh, discussions coming from um, a COP that uh, is being very much known at the African COP at the same time, issues related to adaptation were put really in the bigger context of matter. We have the Sharm el Sheikh adaptation agenda that, cover, that covers areas related to uh, food systems, agriculture, water management, settlements, including urban and rural developments. In addition to that, there are issues related to deforestation and dealing with the, the, the threats uh, related to, uh, to forests and coastal areas. So this is the adaptation agenda um, um, at large that requires finance, technology, and behavioral change to, um, uh, to support. Now, when it comes to the SDGs at large, the Sustainable Development Goals, the um, four human-made reasons um, and shocks and uh, neglect and lack of good prioritization, um, we are only on track of 12% of the 169 targets of the 17 goals. We managed to measure more or less 140 targets of the 169. We're only on target of 12%. 50% of the targets are slightly or significantly off track. And around 35% or more, slightly more, they are worse than where we were back in 2015. Those, the politicians that we met many of them around, they like to blame it on the war in the Ukraine or on, um, on COVID and uh, the shocks associated with the health crisis. But actually we were not on track even before uh, 2019, 2020, and before Ukraine. So we cannot really blame it on these external shocks, but basically it's because of lack of progress from the very beginning on not taking matters related to investment in infrastructure, investments in human capital, which are more important, and investments in resilience. 
And we are now uh, quoting the editor from the Financial Times who moderated the session at the UN a couple of days ago saying, well, we, it's like in, the, in football or soccer, we finished the first half in a very bad way. And we have the second half now towards 2030. If we are going to be continuing doing that, we're going to be missing the goals and targets where there will be more suffering because these are not just numbers. These are basically issues related to uh, people are getting more poor, inequality, deterioration in health systems, education, uh, compromise of our infrastructure, and further deterioration in climate and biodiversity. Sometimes statistics hide behind them what we are concerned about. So there are lessons from the old Millennium Development Goals, um, um, which um, were applied from 2000 to 2015. Um, and the successful countries like China, India, through middle income countries like Indonesia, and some middle income countries in Africa and Latin America, they managed to do better than others um, in the Millennium Development Goals when they have better data systems, better finance, and better implementation with good institutions and, um, and policy framework. The SDGs should benefit from this experience, but seem that we're not really benefiting much from um, the, uh, the, the goods and bads of the MDGs. Now, with the, um, with the SDGs, um, we, uh, we need more of the same data, finance, good implementation. And as far as we can really have um, artificial intelligence, uh, providing positive augmentation of all of that, better data systems for decision making and harnessing technology for good or for the good and doing better in understanding behavioral change and influencing behavioral change. So um, what we need then in, um, in specific areas, of course, the experts are in the room, but I would expect that matters related to better settlements and better uh, construction um, and, and better designs, um, and we have uh, architectures as well, and urban planners in the room. Um, we have first the issues related to the low carbon economies. This is meaning for us the zero targets, doing better in energy and doing better in transport and transportation. Between energy, transportation, and decarbonization. If we can do a better job, whatever you are going to be doing in, in resilience and, and adaptation will be much better. On energy, you can think of utilization of AI, AI or artificial intelligence, to uh, minimize uh, emissions, to have better management of the new renewable um, energies. And uh, they, they suffer from the fact that they are intermittent and they are very much dependent on expensive resources and batteries. So if AI can, could be utilized into that direction, that would be a great plus. On transport, better traffic system uh, with digitalization of the traffic system. And I'm happy through that um, our work, issues related to the digitalization of the traffic systems and uh, relying more on electric uh, uh, buses in Africa and South Asia and some of the small islands have been among the winners of the pipeline of bankable project that we are working on with the UN system, BCG and many others. On decarbonization, especially in the hard to abate sectors like cement, fertilizers, aluminum, steel, especially when it comes to cement, aluminum and steel as inputs in the, in the construction and building material, a great deal of work is required here in order to uh, utilize artificial intelligence to guide us on the priorities. But in all cases, we'll need uh, finance. On the Sharm Sheikh adaptation agenda, food, water, again, settlements, um, agriculture, and dealing with the requirements, I think coming from a farming background, I would appreciate really more guidance in areas related to protection of rural dwellings. People tend, especially in academic institutions, top ones, say there are urban areas and rural areas. Fact of the matter is like my village, it's not urban, it's not uh, rural, it's like some of my former World Bank uh, colleagues call it uh, rural. So you have features of rural and features of urban and you, perhaps you are losing many of resources because of that. But when it comes to agriculture, inefficient irrigation, precision farming would be very much super helpful to, um, uh, to the work. And again, in issues related to productivity and how to enhance the contribution of the farming communities, that would be a plus. Having said that, and I'd like to leave you here with some of the thought, thoughts and great issues of concern. 
many of us, especially in what's called the global south, um, we read about artificial intelligence. Many of, of the people from the global south study in uh, top-notch universities and elite universities, including uh, the new school. And uh, there is that issue of fear of, uh, of, uh, of technology. And there is the, the, the concerns about disruption that I wrote a brief book with colleagues on business governments and SDGs mm -hmm. with a focus on disruptions of technology and how smart disruptions could be, could be helpful. I can see that many people are trying to regulate and super regulate AI. And I think the, the history of dealing with technology, technological advances is basically about identifying the possible good, the possible bad, and trying to maximize the goods and um, deal with the concerns. Yes, there are um, um, uh, definitely, as all technologies had informed us, there could be implications on resources. Um, and artificial intelligence could be de dependent on energy more than necessary. Can we be more efficient in that? Or in core rare material, that is, could be the subject of battles and wars in countries in Africa, especially with the unhealthy competition between some of the big incumbent powers like America or the US, United States, or the emerging powers like China and India. So here, can we have really um, some establishment of the rules um, of the game when it comes to access to core um, uh, rare material? Um, in area, uh, areas related as well to inequality, and this is the old argument forever, when you have technology, there are losers, there are gainers, there are some people, and um, um, I, I was read, um, writing an introduction to the oldest book in Arabic on, the, um, on economics, it goes back to 1908, of course came late after uh, Mr. Adam Smith, but anyway, in that introduction of the book, issues related to um, challenges of technology and how Ms. President Santana of Mexico um, complicated the introduction of railways to, uh, to protect the, the service of transport that was conducted mainly through uh, donkeys and uh, donkey keepers. Uh, the, the, the good motive was there is to keep an old industry from competition, but he delayed his country for years. We know how China, for instance, missed it when they were putting barriers on trade and investment for many years, and that's why they were behind since 1820. We know um, uh, attempts, um, including burning the, um, the, uh, the, the, the chair of wisdom of Mr. Jakar, who developed machines to make us more efficient in uh, producing uh, clothing. And, um, and people who are basically doing it manually felt the, the, thrust, uh, the, the threat of the machine. So typical arguments about uh, Luddite's kind of uh, rejection of new technologies need to be harnessed by good understanding, good policy, and good regulations, and good interactions between the top thinkers, between the policymakers, and those who could be benefiting from that. Our concerns in the Global South that while the advanced technologies are captured and protected, there could be some sort of barriers to access. And then we have the issues as well of regulations that could deny access to um, more information and better, and better knowledge. For us, leapfrogging will be um, uh, exactly right. And whatever fears that could come from artificial intelligence, they wouldn't be as bad at the harm that was caused for many years because of human stupidity in wars, lack of interest in doing good in, in investments in human capital, including health and education, and lack of good prioritization when it comes to, uh, to policies. Having said that, as I said, I have many questions uh, to you, especially in the policy, on the regulations, and how best can we integrate uh, society and get that kind of benefit from AI, especially when it is close to the people, much better than just saying, well, we discovered AI and its cousins or subsectors like machine learning, and we're going to regulate them, and we're going to be putting some codes. This is not helpful. We believe more on free competition, contestability, and access to information, knowledge, and education. And then the good dynamics will prove themselves right at the end, not to outsmart technologies or ourselves. Having said that, very grateful. I'll leave a copy of this book for your consideration at the library if you accept this uh, small gift and many thanks and good luck. Thank you.
So let's give another round of applause to Dr. Mohildin. We're going to be holding a raffle for this book. And uh, no. um, thank you so much for that, for those inspiring remarks. Uh, we're now going to move to the showcase part of this session, where we're going to be hearing from both the New Schools Urban Systems Lab, and then followed by that, uh, WRI, World Resources Institute, about two solutions that can that are AI enabled that can help cities build climate resiliency, uh, and you know having gotten an up close look at some of these solutions, I think they're incredibly exciting. Again, after that we will we will move into the panel discussion. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Timon McPherson to the stage to do his presentation. Thank you. Well, it's not just about cities, that's for sure. We're gonna focus on that a little bit. Thank you, Josh. Um, thank you for those great remarks to really set the scene for us and good morning. I realize the presentation is not loaded yet. One moment, I just saw that. Remember when New York City looked like this? This was just three months ago when New York City had the worst air quality in the world. Or remember when it also looked and felt like this. This was Ida, which happened just two years ago, the worst rainfall-driven event flooding here in, in New York City in our lifetimes, which actually broke a record that was set just a few days before for extreme rainfall. I mention this because the way most people experience climate change is through climate-fueled extreme weather events. And these events are becoming more frequent. They're not only becoming more frequent, they're becoming more intense and they're lasting longer, which makes heat waves, droughts, coastal storms, floods, uh, winter extremes even much more impactful. It means they're impacting more people and they're costing more. Here in the United States, we've already experienced $23 billion disasters in just this year alone. So on top of this, we also have to adapt to a new climate normal of individual extreme events because we have to prepare for events that co-occur. I'll give you an example. Extreme heat and humidity after Hurricane Maria devastated the infrastructure in Puerto Rico in 2017 and then caused a health crisis. But let's look beyond these events. What else do we know? Last year, with hundreds of scientists around the world, we released the outcome of a seven-year assessment effort to assess the global state of climate change by the IPCC. I'm sure you've seen a lot of this. I wanna give you four quick takeaways uh, from this report. The first one, and we've been talking about this already, is that climate change multiplies challenges that we're already facing, including food, energy, and water security, and basically, it makes them worse. Second, it's the poorest and the most marginalized who are facing the worst impacts, and thus, they're the ones who really need the most support, including financial, technological, and institutional support. Third, and to me, this is really the most sobering one that came out of this entire report, is that the next 20 to 30 years of climate change are already built into the climate system. So let's put this in perspective. What this means is that about 16 times as many people may face extreme heat as are already facing it now. And you're probably very familiar with the simmering hot summer that we've just gone through. It also means that up to 1 billion people living in low-lying areas may be exposed to coastal flooding. So to me, a way to kind of interpret this, this data is to say that no matter how aggressively we focus on reducing carbon emissions, which is fundamental, it's even existential, we're not likely to stop the acceleration of climate impacts on our communities for multiple decades. So we need to be focused, as we heard earlier, on adapting to climate change as much as we are focused on halting climate change. So here's a question for you. How much of global finance do you think uh, is focused on adaptation? Any ideas? 10%, 10%, right? Clearly, we have to aggressively scale up finance and investments in adaptation and resilience, including through engineered approaches, through nature-based approaches, also social and institutional transformations. The last point I wanna make from the report is that what we also showed is that the impacts on people, 
infrastructure and economies will be largest in cities and urbanized regions. And that's because they're concentrated in those areas. So this also means it makes cities the locus for where scaled up investment and adaptation can have significant positive impacts on people's lives. In short, cities can be turned from problems into solutions, but they need open access to the best technology. Even if we solve the finance gap, they need open access to the best technology and data to be able to make adaptation investments and decisions in the places where they can have real impact on people. I'll give you some examples here. The city of New York has spent millions of dollars on investments in technology, on investments in scientific research and data to make informed decisions on where and how to adapt to coastal flooding, to urban flooding, to extreme heat. Here's one I want to just dial in just to show you how we've been doing this and what this means for cities who don't have the same resources. In 2018, after Hurricane Harvey devastated Houston, Texas, we realized in New York that we just don't know enough about how extreme rainfall may cause flooding here in our city. So we set about to change that. In a large team modeling effort uh, that we co-led here out of the new school, the team spent three years using the latest hydrological models to generate new data for decision making. In May 2021, before that Ida storm that I showed you, the city released the stormwater resiliency plan and included the outputs of that technical effort to help us learn under different rainfall and coastal sea level rise scenarios where it's going to flood, how deep it's going to be, and that information was provided with high spatial specificity. So now we are able to better prioritize millions to billions of dollars in flood resilience investments where they can have the most impact on reducing exposure and risk of flooding for people, for their homes, for their schools, for the critical infrastructure that they depend on for everyday life in the city. And this is just one of many examples uh, we could all talk about and probably show from well-resourced cities and how they're advancing resilience and adaptation through advanced technology and data. And it's built on data like you see here that's truly impressive. But frankly, most cities, even most communities, don't have an access to this data. In fact, just outside the city here, towns outside New York don't have access to the same data. In the US alone, there's over 5,000 cities and towns who have limited access to climate risk data. And globally, there's more than a million cities, towns, and communities, formal and informal areas, who lack local scale risk information. So they just basically don't have the data to ensure that the trillions of dollars of investments in development in the next decade will also protect, prepare, and help them respond to what the increasing climate challenges uh, are coming their way. So the question really is, how can we drive forward a climate resilient development agenda if we don't know what we have to be resilient to? Imagine if we could bring similar or better data to all communities and across the world to make those decisions so that we can safeguard people. And that's exactly what we want to do. This is the showcase we want to present to you today that we're excited to talk about. We're announcing a major new effort we're calling Climate IQ to open access to the best available climate risk information but also to take the next technological leap to leverage AI to learn from and provide access to the rapidly changing data and climate landscape. I'll just introduce this a little further. Here are some of the goals of this. First, we want to create a next generation AI environment to drive forward latest advances in machine learning and computation and data integration to provide more accurate, higher resolution climate information, especially for multiple hazards, for extreme heat, drought, air pollution, and flooding. Importantly, and this I think really picks up on the points from the previous talk, the key here is to democratize the access, to make this open and available to everyone. We want this technology to be able to help support cities, towns, and decision makers at all levels in order to inform planning, to prioritize adaptation decisions for, for impact, and also to unlock adaptation finance in the areas that need it most. Who's it for? It's for everybody. But especially as we've been talking about communities, towns, and city level decision makers who really need this hazard exposure data so they can pinpoint the places where they need to focus what are likely going to be limited amounts of funds that have to be as impactful as they can be. How can you use it? 
Well, outputs, as you can see here from Climate IQ, will be fed into an open access public dashboard enabling users to view current, near term, and future risk, and to do that for multiple types of hazards. You're probably wondering, since this is pretty ambitious, how this is actually going to work. So let me walk you through it just a little bit briefly. We brought together an incredible, talented team across the world, including support from Google engineers to help us develop the AI infrastructure and the data backends. We're going to be leveraging machine learning through uh, techniques like convolutional neural networks. We're going to leverage lots of sources of big data uh, and also multiple climate hazard modeling environments. So this means bringing together, in some ways for the first time, outputs from hydrological models, from weather forecasting models, from climate projection models, along with data on land use, buildings, roads, and other infrastructure that are all fed into the machine learning environment so that it can continuously learn and improve its ability to predict exposure to multiple climate hazards. On top of that, we've got to test it. So that means also validating and verifying those outputs with other kinds of event databases, but also critically together with partner cities. This is my last slide. We're going to be developing and testing climate IQ in a whole range of cities. That's kind of key for the impact here. This is so the AI can learn patterns in large and small city and urbanized areas, in formal and informal areas, in temperate, tropical, and desert climates, and in older and newer and developing cities. So to make this happen, of course, requires a lot of partnerships and the ability to look across a range of city types that can feed this critical local, national, and global data into the AI core that can then produce outputs for any city that has similar characteristics. We're super thrilled to be able to be partnering with the city of New York as our first city partner to help us develop, test, and validate this approach, and thank them for coming on board early with us, uh, giving us a vote of confidence and moving this forward, and we're in active discussions with a number of other city partners. I also want to mention that our team includes a whole range of experts, including from ClimaSense, a climate tech startup, which you saw an early prototype of their UA, uh, UI UX environment that was developed with the Australian Red Cross and the city of Melbourne. We also have amazing partners from the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics, the Stockholm Resilience Center, the Virginia Climate Center, uh, George Mason University, and the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies that's just north of here, just outside the city. Finally, a key component of this is the volunteer team of Google Fellows that we'll be working with, and as we heard, the critical support from Google.org's Climate Innovation Program that makes this possible. So we thank them uh, for believing in this and seeing the ambition that needs to be solved to really address uh, adaptation globally. We're also very proud to be able to call the new school home for this project and here at the Urban Systems Lab. So I'd love to tell you more about this, especially afterwards. We're gonna move to the next showcase here in a moment, but I just also wanna say that uh, please stay in touch, follow us on social media and subscribe to newsletters to get updates. And if you work for or with the city, we really wanna hear from you. Please reach out to us because we'd love to talk with you about how we can work together to initiate what we think is the beginning of a wider moonshot effort to address the global climate adaptation challenge that we face. Thanks so much. I'm also going to invite up uh, my colleague from WRI, Evan, to tell you about the amazing work that they're doing as well. Thanks, Evan. Thank you, Chime, and thank you to everyone here for joining. It's a busy week, but it's so exciting to get to speak to you. Uh, my hope for today is to unpack the term AI. We hear it a lot. You can't read a newspaper without seeing the headlines. You can't throw a stick and hit a conference here at Nunga that's focused on AI for something, either in concern, so how are we going to regulate AI, how do we prevent harms, or in opportunity. And so I want to go a little deeper and unpack how are we using AI today? What are we actually using it for? What changes when we use AI in our work on urban climate action? And how might that be different in the future uh, with future systems? Along the way, I'll touch on work we're doing with Google. I'll touch on some very exciting products that are actually coming out uh, for many others. And we'll try to weave this together into a picture of what we can actually expect from these technologies and what we should really be concerned about and what we should really be hopeful for. Um, so we'll walk through. In terms of what AI is helping us do today, Today, and for the last few years, WRI has been at the forefront of using AI to help us see with local resolution at global scale. What do I mean by that? Let's take a trip back in history, back to 2014. You're seeing a data set here called the Human Global Sediment Layer. 
It's kind of beautiful in its own sort of celestial way. It looks almost like a constellation of stars. But imagine trying to use that data set to make any sort of urban climate action. I can't personally think of an action. You might be able to say there's a little bit more settlement over here, or there's a new settlement that's come online that we haven't seen before. But almost inevitably, people living in those settlements will be known and registered. They'll be aware. And so you really can't imagine much action. But flash forward a few years, and we've had revolutions in a number of technologies that then combine into this sort of umbrella technology and term we call AI. We have new satellite imagery. Sentinel-2, which is a great sensor for these types of issues. 10 meter resolution, we're starting to get to the point where we can actually see urban environments, came online in 2015. We see training data and machine learning and neural networks. We see revolutionary work uh, to make those, make those applicable from folks like Google. And we see platforms like Google Earth Engine that allow scientists and researchers to actually do this machine learning for their problems, for their communities, and to make this work. All of that adds up into some incredible tools that we have today. We can see the, sound, the challenge now. We can see urban heat islands from satellite imagery and understand where there might be places where we need to put in place um, efforts to mitigate extreme heat. We can also understand how human activity at the urban level is changing this. On the right, you see a recent paper that we published focused on types of land use and informal settlements and various forms of land use that actually either contribute to solutions or challenges when it comes to people experiencing extreme heat. In addition to just seeing the challenge, we're also starting to be able to track the solution. As you see here, our Global Forest Watch product, and we earlier this year launched a new uh, forest product that allows us to see for the first time at the full global scale across the tropics that GS GFW works at, down to the level of individual trees. So you can actually track if commitments were made for urban greening, where they followed through on. And that could be consistent across hundreds and hundreds of cities around the world, allowing us to do research, allowing us to compare, allow us to understand economic benefits, and turn that back into better arguments about how we should uh, do better urban planning in the future. All of that adds up to incredible planning. This is nothing without connecting the data and tools that I've described, what AI gives us, with work on the ground. You'll hear later on the panel from my colleague Jaya, who's on our Ross Center team in India. Uh, and every day they go out and work on plans. They work on strategies. They work on knocking down barriers to, to implementation of these tools with local policymakers. That's where the action is. But all that action can be guided, directed, and supported by these AI tools that allow us to see the problem and monitor and track the solution better. Now, if you take a step back and you look at the most recent headlines that aren't AI, satellite imagery doesn't actually come up much when we talk about AI today. Instead, most folks can, are concerned with a class of AI that focuses on language, that focuses on generation of language, these large language models. You've heard of them. Uh, every tech company has one. Uh, there's dozens of other tech companies popping up every day with a new model. And we're left with this question of how will AI help us tomorrow? We understand that it allows us to see things, to see problems and understand and plan and act. But this set of language technologies, what can it actually yield for us as folks who care about urban climate action? In our work, we're finding that where LLMs are useful are two important challenges that the climate community faces overall. We have a lot of data, but we don't always have insight. We don't always have a clear view of what that data might mean for a specific situation. And we find that LLMs can actually help with that insight part of the equation. Similarly, once we have insight, there's often barriers to action. Things take a long time. It can take a long time to do certain small tasks. And then when all those tasks stack up to a project or an initiative or to a, you know, a mayoral administration, it can take a long time to actually get to action. And while not perfect, uh, and I could share a little bit in the next demo, we believe that LLMs can actually shorten that time to insight, shorten that time to action, and overall allow us to deliver more for our communities. Now, I should stop here before I go into a demo and say that at WRI, uh, we have internal policies around this with our team. Uh, these are just our policies. They're relevant for our context. They may not be relevant for yours, but I'll share them, hopefully, to, to kind of make sure that you're, you're, you're seeing this with the appropriate guidelines. First is to keep the human in the, in the, in the loop. Um, we asked our staff if they're going to use these tools to actually check the outputs. They are still responsible for the outputs of any work done with LLMs. As a person, as an author of a report, or as someone who's producing a dashboard, you're still responsible. 
Second, don't share sensitive, confidential, or private information. Uh, I think this is a general policy. Even folks like Google, if you look at BARD, it says, you know, don't share anything you wouldn't want someone else to see here. This isn't because we don't directly trust these tools. It's because they're under development. It's new technology. We need to set guide rules. The regulations aren't there. And so while we don't do that, we ask folks not to share that. We don't share sensitive information that maybe we get from a partner. We don't share personal sensitive information in these tools when we're prompting. And then finally, and this one gets a little challenging, focus on automating tasks you understand well. Uh, your ability to use these tools actually comes from a place of being able to converse with them, to direct them, to focus them, uh, and, and actually over time inform them about what you want to get out of it. And so it's better to focus on tasks that take you a lot of time but that you understand well, instead of trying to do something you've never done before with these tools. So with those guidelines in mind, I'm gonna share a little bit about how uh, I was using a tool from Google called BARD uh, to solve an urban climate action problem uh, for myself earlier. In our work uh, around analyzing interventions uh, to, to mitigate extreme heat risk, we care a lot about what cities are actually doing. We care about where are they planting trees? We care about where policy changes. Often, and especially in places where I don't live, that data can be hard to access. You can talk to policymakers. They themselves sometimes struggle to track these things. Uh, work is happening across so many different departments, so many different places. And so simply to get together a list of sites where certain actions were taken by government that may add up to better climate outcomes and, and, and lowering urban heat uh, can be a challenge. So in the sort of demo problem, I decided to look at a series of press releases from our own NYC park system. These are press releases they put out when they do a renovation, when they build a new park. There are hundreds of them online if you go there. Uh, and each of them is written as a press release, right? This is a so-and-so said this, so-and-so cut a ribbon. But they also have a lot of very interesting information. They often describe how much money the project costs. They describe what the project was, where it was. And there's a lot of information baked into these press releases. They're also real time. If something happened today, if you know someone's cutting a ribbon on a park, there's gonna be a press release about it. So it's very current. The challenge is extracting this information and getting it into a format where we can analyze, getting it into something where we can put it on a map or where I can actually you know, work with our teams and understand, say, looking at satellite imagery, was there any meaningful change after a project happened? And so the way this works, they take those press releases plus the BARD tool, feed it in, and give this a prompt. I'm sorry if this is text a little small for folks in the back, but this all starts with asking a question. And I set this up for BARD by saying, I'm going to give you some press releases, and I want you to pull out four pieces of information from each of those press releases. What's the location of the park? What work was done at the park? Was this a renovation? Or was this an entirely new park, etc.? And I say, I'd like to know the cost of the work. And then finally, I'd like to know if this work is focused on improving resilience or adaptation, I want you to note that for me. And then I also ask, is there any questions? It's, these are conversational engines, and they work better when you converse with them, we found. Um, Bard responds, that works. I understand your request. I think you can do that. Let's try this out. So I feed in the first, and it's abbreviated here, but essentially it's a big block of text that I just copy pasted from a press release and put right in here. And Bard does a very good job, or at least appears to do a very good job right on the surface here. We now have a table that says Shore Ridge Park and Bay Ridge. The work that was done is a new dog run, cost a million dollars, and yes, there's been some work here to adapt uh, the surface uh, for excessive rainwater. And it goes into a, a little detail there, actually a very useful blurb. So that's great, but to the point of always checking our work and making sure that we're going back and validating what these LOMs are doing, let's actually go to the press release itself. So it got the location right, it got the work done right, it got the cost right, and it even got the resilience right, uh, resilience part right. And it's, it's useful, you'll note, and this is probably very small at the bottom here, but the word resilience is never used. And that's the power of these LMs. They can actually parse text in ways that are human. So if a human analyst were to read this and say, uh, yeah, I would score that as resilience, there's an opportunity for the LMs to actually mirror that, not perfectly and not always, but to allow us to pull out concepts and, and things and categorize them uh, appropriately. And so, of course, one press release is useful. That saved me a little bit of time from reading that whole thing and coding it, putting that data in a spreadsheet. But where the value comes in is being able to do tens of these or hundreds of these. And so following that pattern again, just looping over press releases, I was able to build a table, a spreadsheet of this. Over time, I actually realized that 
um, I wanted uh, BARD to actually change something. So I wanted to give me a binary variable of just yes or no, whether there was a resilience project. And I also wanted the text. I wanted a short summary. That was as simple as just saying, hey, can you go back, reanalyze these things, and add in just a column that says yes, no. Now, for any data scientists in the room, and I'm a data scientist, to do all this normally is a lot of time. I'm sitting there coding. I'm looking up how do I do this, especially in my day job now where my main job is meetings and working with people. So if I get an hour to code, I'm sitting there, you know, instead, simply by working the prompts and working in conversational language, I'm able to get this complex data structure together. And of course, you know, to the back to the original goal, in this, I find ones where there are projects that are intended to mitigate urban heat island effects. And so in practice, I would take those, build a separate data set of those, mark those, and then actually look at over time how temperatures change in those locations. And then we can actually look at, at scale, is this working? Can we adjust strategy? Do we need to engage policymakers on a whole new strategy over time? Interesting enough, I want to remind you, LLMs aren't perfect. These aren't tools that are they're magic or that are doing anything beyond really complex matrix math across massive data sets. And so it's important to keep humans in loop, but they are useful in being conversational. And a trick that I've used often is you can actually ask an LLM what it's not confident about, what maybe you should check by hand. And so in this case, um, there were a couple where, you know, whether it's a resilience or an adaptation project is a judgment call even in practice. If I had a, you know, an analyst on my team work on this, we would have conversations around, is this project an appropriate resilience project or not, et cetera. In the same way, I can say, hey, are there any of these that you're not confident about, where you read something in the description, but you weren't sure if the goal was resilience or adaptation? And so it actually picked one out and said, I'm not super sure about this. Um, it says there's going to be a new synthetic turf field with a stormwater management system but I'm not certain if that directly connects to a resilience goal or outcome. So in that case, I could take that one. I could call up a contact or simply go to the place or consult with an expert to figure that out. But allowing the imperfection to stand in our way of using these tools uh, actually means we won't actually find out about them, right? And so within, with these guide guards, with safe lines, we're able to get actually a lot out of these tools. So in the end, and this is where as a data scientist, this is super exciting for me, because now instead of writing code to geocode something, when I had this table, didn't even have addresses or locations, right? I had a park and then I had a, a borough or a neighborhood, something like that. And I said, Bard, can you geocode this and then put it on a map? And there in 10 minutes, I've taken text data. I've done probably you know, years of NLP to, to kind of train up on getting NLP to extract entities, to, to summarize key terms. I put that in a table and then I've made a map simply through about five or six prompts and a little iteration. And so for us, at the level of insight and action, this is where LLMs are actually incredibly useful, right? We're getting to insight quicker. I can actually understand something so I can move on to my big question, which is how are these projects and implementing them in NYC parks, how is that actually gonna help in mitigating urban heat island effects? Uh, and then you know, action. Well, this of course doesn't imply any action directly. Uh, the fact that I have a map this afternoon today means that I could hop on a call with a partner or a policymaker much more quickly and give them guidance. And overall, when we think about these timelines to 2030, we think about these big things, it's all time. How can we compress that? How can we tighten this up a bit so that the real work, the stuff that will take a lot of work and can't be automated, work with communities, work at the policy level, that that can actually have enough time to do that work because we're automating some of this back office stuff. So thank you for going along on this journey with me. Um, we're really excited to continue using both the AI we use today and then the AI in the future. And we always love to work with new partners and collaborators. So please do get in touch. Thank you. We'll get you set up. All right, let's give both of our presenters a round of applause from WRI and the New School Urban Systems Lab. So I'm so excited that now we're actually going to transition to the panel discussion and we've got a panel that includes an incredibly impressive group of leaders from across sectors and I'm going to briefly introduce them but I'll let their their remarks do all the talking. Uh, so first we're going to have Rit Argawal, who's the New York City's Chief Climate Officer and Commissioner of Environmental Protection. We have Gino Van Bagen, Secretary General of ICLEI Local Governments for Sustainability. We have Jaya Dinda from the WRI. She's the interim director of the WRI India Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. And then we have Alex Diaz from Google.org. He's a senior manager of AI for social good and crisis response. 
The panel is going to be moderated, as Dr. White said earlier, will be moderated by Joel Towers, who's a professor of architecture and sustainable design at the Parsons School of Design and the co-director of the Tishman Environment and Design Center. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming these leaders to the stage. As I mentioned before, we are going to have a uh, Q&A session, so please get your questions ready. And I believe there will be mics that will be brought to the audience to uh, facilitate that. So thank you. Thank you, Josh. And um, just to pick up where, where Evan left off, it's all about time and, and, and the compression of time. And we're running a little bit late. So I'm gonna do my best to compress the time so that we can actually get to a couple questions if we have them. But we have this extraordinary panel here, uh, which I'm very pleased to be able uh, to moderate and um, following uh, time and, and um, Evan's presentations. Uh, we have a lot, I think, to think about uh, and to discuss as it relates to the expertise uh, of our guests today. Um, I wanted to just frame the conversation very briefly uh, as um, each of you consider the, the, converse, the questions that we'll uh, discuss today um, around issues that have come up already in the, in the first part of the uh, session, around hope and fear, uh, because I think AI generates a tremendous amount of hope and it generates a tremendous amount of fear, um, about questions of trust, um, where information comes from. I personally trust every press release that comes out of the city of New York. Um, and so uh, if the underlying data is coming from someplace, how are we ground truthing uh, the information that produces uh, all of these new maps for us to think about? And how does the technology itself help us advance questions at this pace and with the urgency necessary to the changes uh, that we know need to occur um, in the context of a tremendous amount of misinformation. Uh, and so we, we sit, I think, at a really important um, hinge point in the ways in which technology can help to achieve the, the critical goals, the existential questions that Timon mentioned, and at the same time, um, having to do that in, the, in an environment in which the building of trust seems so critical. So um, uh, I, I think, um, Red, if I could start with you um, in that context, uh, because I think uh, New York has been presented here rightly as doing a tremendous amount of work over a long period of time to try to address these, these crises. But um, knowing you and the work that's going on, there's so much more to do. Uh, you recently um, uh, uh, did a piece in the Times a couple weeks ago um, reminding people that panic and despair are not necessarily useful uh, um, uh, in relationship to thinking about emergencies. Um, tell us how to avoid panic and despair. What are the issues in New York where you see AI and new technologies really helping to consider this future? Um, well, thank you, Joel, and, and thanks to uh, the New School and all of the organizers and Timon and, and Evan, and of course, uh, particularly Timon's work at, at the NPCC, uh, which is so important in New York City. Um, I guess to, to answer your question, I mean, what we've seen today and, and the tremendous work that's gone on, and I'll speak selfishly, for New York, leveraging data to understand the challenges we face and, and help prioritize the work has been tremendously useful. And so that is a, a source of hope. Um, as I sit here though, I cannot help but think about the flip side of that, which is the fear. Um, and to me, and, and I think the real question, and, and I'd love to put the challenge out to so many of you who are engaged in AI and, and data and the climate crisis, is to think about the delivery because one of the things that I wrestle with all the time is the fact that knowing what we have to do does not mean that we can do it. And it certainly does not mean we can do it in time. And so, you know, I, I think there's something really useful. Sometimes information speeds things up 
So I'll tell you just a, an example of, of something that I'm really pleased with. We'll, we'll have more to say about this publicly in, in a couple of weeks, but people assume that aging infrastructure is bad. We've actually now done some research. Uh, we had a big water main break in, in Times Square a couple of weeks ago. The New Yorkers here will remember that. The pipe that burst was from 1896. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we were just a week or two behind in getting our numbers on this, but I had a, a while ago commissioned some internal research at DEP asking whether age was in fact correlated with the likelihood of a water main to break. It is not at all. And in fact, I tell you, you would much rather live on a street with a water main from 1890 than from 1960. Because it's about design, it's about material, and it's about maintenance. Um, and that insight can help inform the way we do ongoing water main replacements. And over the long term, it can certainly fine tune the work we do. It does not, however, change the fact that we are still only replacing a small number of water mains, right? And so uh, the great work that Time and others contributed to that now give us a, a clear sense of where flooding is, is taking place and is likely to take place in New York City is phenomenal. It's really helpful. By the way, one of the really interesting things I've found, as I have done over the, over the last two years that I've been a uh, commissioner, I've, I've done a number of walking tours with neighborhoods and council members and others to see, oh, here's where we flooded during Hurricane Ida, here's where we flooded on April 30th when we had a big storm, et cetera. And when the simple fact that we can now take a map, a printout, and show people that, yes, we know, like this isn't that we are flying blind, we know that your neighborhood is at a hot spot, right? And we can begin to understand why, that's tremendously reassuring. It does not change the fact that at the highest priority locations we have, designing and implementing, whether it is a green infrastructure solution or an underground solution, is between a five and 10 year challenge, right? And so the really interesting question, I think, after we figure all of this out, and there is no question that I speak from a position of privilege because of all of the resources that New York City has, both within the government and the civic community is exemplified by the NPCC that support us with data that, that as Timon pointed out, even you know, Jersey City doesn't have access to. Right, so that's super valuable. But the biggest opportunity is going to come when we can use AI to do the engineering work, right? To do the community engagement work, or at least to speed all of that up. As Evan pointed out, you've got to have the human in the loop. You're not going to automate community engagement. But how do we shave the weeks and months and ideally years off of it? Because that's the only way that we can make the uh, speed of infrastructure change begin to catch up with the speed of information change. So, um, Rit, you might not know, but we're, we're sitting in a building that has experienced some of those water main challenges. Um, this building flooded when a three foot diameter water main in Fifth Avenue uh, shattered three weeks after we opened it. So we're familiar with that map <laughs> here at the New School. Um, but I, I think this question of um, how long it takes to make change, and again, coming back to the issue of time, is of course different uh, from different in the different locations around the world that are seeking to adapt to and mitigate climate change. And Jaya, I wanted to turn to you um, in particular on this question. Um, uh, you you also in a recent piece about five ways India can um, uh, innovate uh, to meet urbanization challenges. It was a really fascinating piece, but I I was uh, struck by the fifth point the question of leveling the playing field. And so, um, again, the, the question of who is most impacted, how innovation occurs, um, where resources are deployed, uh, and, in, and then, of course, in places that are building infrastructure, um, how that leapfrogging happens. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that's, you see that. Sure, and thank you, Joel, and uh, New School for inviting me here for this uh, talk. Um, I think for the work that we've been doing at WRI, uh, a lot of it has started and on the innovation side, uh, looking at innovation for not just climate change, but you know, urbanization challenges as well. 
a lot of it has been focused on optimizing resources, on connecting people, like what was just mentioning, and also looking at basically how do you improve businesses and economic outputs. And in the process, uh, there is the opportunity to deliver huge climate co-benefits. And, and how do you look at all that together? Um, a lot of what we realized, and, and India is sort of the outside of, I think, California is so the second largest sort of hub of innovation uh, that's happening. Um, a lot of it is targeted at public good. It started out with things like, you know, um, e-commerce platforms and, you know, all of that. But uh, there's a lot of innovation that's happening for public good, except it's not getting to the public that needs it the most. Um, and so we have three types uh, of innovation that's happening. One is on the data side of things. So uh, just looking at data analytics, looking at the use of AI and ML to develop baselines for cities, to look at projections of what certain scenarios might look like, and then to kind of um, figure out pathways uh, which can help with decision making and, and where this can go. So decision support systems. So that's one part of it. Um, and most recently, I can think of, uh, you know, like the Mumbai and the Bangalore climate action plans were formulated for the first time leveraging data from at least 40 plus agencies in each of those cities. Uh, no mean task, mind you, and basically establishing that for the first time to say, this is where we are. This is what it looks like right now. We never had that before. So this is a big part of what's happening, which stands to basically in a way level the playing field to understand where we're at. The second part is looking at, um, you know, innovation for hard infrastructure solutions. Uh, and we've had, you know, companies come to us, we've been talking with innovators on the energy side of things, on the water side of things. We're looking at optimizing and driving efficiency and resource use. So they're looking at how can we bring in things like sensors into buildings, uh, into you know, living spaces to optimize for the energy use of that space. How can we you look at reducing water consumption and water usage? Uh, and some of these, you know, the claims that they make, and we also tested them, uh, they're, they're kind of reducing 50% of domestic water usage and thereby reducing the cost of a household by 40%, and so on and so forth. So there's those kind of solutions on the one hand, and we're trying to see if there's a way to mainstream them through government contracts, so onboarding them through procurement processes that can lead to a larger sort of public dissemination of these kind of innovations. Um, the third kind basically is around uh, software as a service. Uh, and I'll go with the, the NAP, no acronym, acronyms here. It's actually called SAS. But um, essentially looking at uh, things like, you know, you're talking about putting solar, you know, on rooftops, for example, and that being a huge source of energy and renewable energy. But looking more closely at what percentage of that roof, rooftop can I actually solarize to get the kind of efficiency and outputs that I need. The entire rooftop, you know, technically speaking, you cannot put a solar panel on all of it and then, you know, get the kind of, um, you know, energy efficiency that you're looking at. So that's one, looking at restoration potential. I think Kevin talked about that and looking at, you know, where is planting being removed in cities? Where is their restoration potential? Mapping that, doing some of the on-ground surveys saying, okay, this is where the restoration potential is. This is where things like nature-based solutions can be implemented. And these are the kind of solutions which will give you the biggest bang for the buck. So um, that's, that's happening. But in all of this, I would like to say that when it comes to you know, the level playing field, word of caution. Uh, and that is that this is all additional cost whether it's for the cities, whether it's for the industries who are adopting these, these solutions, these are additional costs. So when you look at global South cities, which are very crash strapped and they really don't have a lot of you know, spending ability per capita, where is this money going to come from is a big question for us. And while the bigger cities, for example, in India, Mumbai or Bangalore can probably you know, absorb these costs relatively more easily, what happens to you know, the, the thousands of cities and smaller urban areas which don't have those capabilities. And so therefore we need to look at what are some of the alternative solutions which can drive at that, but at the same time lead to the kind of co-benefits that we're seeking. So returning us to the finance question that we, that we started with. Um, uh, Gino, I, I wanted to ask you if, um, 
hearing these sort of two uh, uh, initial perspectives um, from uh, from New York and from India, um, if you using the kind of ICLI lens <laughs> across 2,500 uh, partner cities and locations, um, where are you seeing the trends in the engagement with technologies and machine learning and artificial intelligence um, begin to, to perhaps change the shape of the problem? Uh, which cities um, are able to start to take advantage of this and where are the risks and concerns? Thank you very much and um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, on that question, I think what we see as a, as a general trend, and that is both uh, cities in the global north and in the global south, is that there is um, an absolute need for data. Um, in order to make um, decision making, especially when it comes to solutions for climate change, uh, to, to make that, to take those decisions in a science based way. And so the first thing is that um, we see that there is an absolute lack of, of data information. Um, um, and, 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 and in particular, when it comes to um, looking to a solutions on or for adaptation to the impacts of climate change. So whilst there might be data available at, at national level or regional level, um, th that data is not being decentralized um, at, at the local level. So for many cities um, around the world, it is, it is very difficult to take or to anticipate um, the right decision making and, 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 and steps in order to, um, for example, to, to adapt to climate change. So that there is a, there is a need, first of all, to, um, to, to get that data um, because it is not yet there. And therefore, I think the machine learning and, and artificial intelligence can be a tool that helps us to get there faster, as it was also said by, by presenters earlier. We, from our side, for example, here in, 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 ICLE, uh, in, in the US, um, ICLE USA has been working for a decade now with a, a software tool that we call ClearPath, to, um, which allows to, uh, to um, inventorize uh, greenhouse gas emissions, to set the targets, and to um, allow also to deploy um, strategies. For more than 1,000 cities uh, here in, 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 in the US, this has been done, and, and they are using the tool. Um, but, but imagine that through um, AI and, and machine learning, we could um, um, speed up the, the, for other cities that are coming into that and using that tool, we could speed up the, um, the process for them to choose, select um, um, solutions um, and, and make decisions from those other cities with similar attributes, for example. So, the, the, there is definitely an, 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 a big value of, of using the um, uh, AI and, 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 and machine learning to speed up again that process. Um, we are working with, with Google also um, on, on um, bringing in further information that, that Google has as a very vast location data-based uh, information they have, for example, in terms of transportation, in terms of uh, vehicle miles traveled per transportation mode, or um, intensity data of buildings in cities, and trying to bring that together and incorporate that in, in those tools. So yes, um, on your question, I think we, we see that there's an, an, an absolute need for that further data processing, accessing the data, and then um, um, working with the data. At the same time, I think for cities, um, there is still this fear, um, and I think that is where we come in, um, at least where we try to come in, to help them to understand that, that um, if it is done in the right way, and I, I am grateful for the presenters earlier uh, this morning for, for you know, focusing on, on the human piece of, of AI and, and that, we, that we look into that in a careful manner and, and act and responsibly use um, AI. I think we, we, in that way, we want to become or help cities um, to be 
um, more trusted or to help to, to create that trust. At the same time, um, and, and I think in that sense, especially in Europe now, um, there is a, um, a, um, an absolute movement and understanding at the highest levels in the European Union, for example, of a need to have some kind of standardization and an approach towards AI. The, the um, uh, European Union Artificial um, Intelligence Act is going to come out at the end of this, of this year. Um, it, it, it puts really the focus on, on human needs um, uh, and, and the values of that, um, whilst at the same time, of course, um, saying and, 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 and putting the efforts on, on, the, on the, the value of, 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 um, of AI. But um, one of the examples also here or, or suggested are being made is perhaps to create a sort of an IPCC um, for, for uh, artificial intelligence where you would have, you know, really scientists coming together and making the right recommendation of how to use uh, in best ways possible, in valuable ways possible, um, AI. So all of that is, is, is ongoing. I think that is going to reflect and, and have also um, positive impact on, on, uh, um, on cities and for cities. Um, so I, I think it, also the, 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 uh, the examples brought here this morning, I think that is the way forward if, if we can again, um, speed up this entire process and use it in the in in best way. But we are not yet there. But I think the trend is, is, is being set uh, for sure. Gino, I want to pick up on the philanthropy comment you made earlier, but I think we should also um, commit ourselves to uh, that IPCC for, for AI, including a chapter on HS. Um, and how the two are connected. Uh, so, um, <laughs> Alex, I want to go to you <clears throat> on the question of philanthropy because you sit here on the panel having also made a great deal of things possible in this space. Uh, and as a researcher, we know the importance of, of what you're able to jumpstart through that kind of the work that Google is doing. And so I wanted, though, to ask you to think not just about why is it important that philanthropy is engaging in these questions? But when we go back to Timon's um, uh, slide about 10% of global finance addressing adaptation, um, if we had the percentage of global philanthropy focused on climate and environmental justice issues, it's tiny. What is it going to take for philanthropy to really transform itself to focus on these critical questions? One, and then I'm going to ask you to start the the row back down this way to say what is the what are the biggest issues issue pick an issue that's a challenge that you think is really central to each of your areas that we can say would benefit from technology AI focus and then we will open it to questions so this is your cue to prepare yourself for questions as we come back down this way Alex thank you Joel. Um, Philanthropy is risk capital, especially when it comes to developing technological solutions, especially AI. Organizations like Google.org were one of the largest funders of AI for Good projects, having donated over 200 million in cash in the last five years. We are able to provide that flexible risk capital to take risks. And I think where governments and other philanthropies might come in, they might not have that high of a risk tolerance. Um, but it's important to start to build an evidence base for particular solutions. And then importantly from that, once you build the evidence base, create partnerships that can help leverage and scale that, and especially working in close partnership with governments that have that public accountability and that can help sustain whatever, whatever innovations get built. So let me give you a couple of examples of how this has worked through the work that I lead on uh, leading our AI for good work. COVID hit. And the minister of the, the ICT minister of the government of Togo, Sina Lawson, an incredible advocate for, uh, for using uh, advanced technologies to, to drive change, came to us and said, hey, we have a bunch of stimulus money that we need to get out into people's hands that are vulnerable right now, but we can't go door to door because of the pandemic. 
are there some technological solutions that can exist that can help us do that more quickly uh, to help? Because it's needed, it's vital. And we had been working with a nonprofit called Give Directly that provides direct cash transfers, and we've been helping build that evidence base for why we should just give cash as a viable intervention tool. And they have been working with UC Berkeley with, uh, with Josh Blumenstock's lab that can combine a couple of different data layers that can help improve the targeting of aid and do it in a much more quickly and importantly for COVID remote way. So they use satellite imagery data, looked at things like roofing material. They worked with telecommunications companies to get aggregate signals from telcos that can glean relative proxies of relative wealth that give you a good enough first draft of if you need to target your aid, here are some locations to focus. And they stood up this Novisi program in the government of Togo that was able to get uh, cash into the hands of hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of people in a span of weeks, which normally would have taken, even with door-to-door, -door, months. Now let's fast forward and connect to some work uh, that the new school is leading. Uh, now that we know that that digital infrastructure, and importantly, once the digital infrastructure is built, it could be reused. It's a digital public good. Now that we know that that can be done, and now that we know that there are advancements in predicting disasters, I think we have the tools now, the capabilities to be able to predict things like floods has vastly improved in the last couple of years. So now that we know with more lead time and with better granularity that a catastrophic flood might be coming, what can we do now that this digital infrastructure is built to provide cash in advance? How can we get cash to vulnerable populations before the disasters hit? Because what we've often heard from uh, the, the beneficiaries and the organizations, the communities that our, our, our grantees work with is they might not have access to early warning systems. We can solve that. They might get access to an early warning system, but not understand that. That's a human problem. We could solve that. But what about those that get access to their early warnings? They understand them, but they don't have the resources to do anything about it. Now, because of AI, we can get action faster more informed and data-driven. And I think if were it not for the ability to de-risk some of these interesting innovations and build that evidence base, we would not be able to have conversations with governments, with USAID, with others to say, hey, have you thought about, we're not saying this needs to be the panacea and needs to be in the entirety of your work, but doing more of it. And time is of the essence. So essentially, planning as opposed to emergency response. Yeah, for every dollar you're putting into preparedness, you're saving on the order of seven to $15 in response. So would you say that if the issue is for the biggest issue you're seeing is that capacity to, to flip the paradigm um, in that regard? Yeah, it's, 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 it's almost like a basic human psychological bias of how do we get folks in, from being entirely reactive to more proactive? And as a father of a, of a four month old, the like climate crisis, I want to make sure that my son can be around long enough. And I think we're not for leadership like RIT and others, like we need to be doing things earlier. And we have the tools, our capability. It's a matter of will and collective action. Do you know what's the biggest thing you think we should be focused on? So just two small examples, I think, in terms of benefits also um, for cities. The, the, um, for example, in, in, in Stockholm now, um, an entire digital platform has been put um, um, uh, to life that is AI uh, driven um, and which brings together the, um, uh, the citizens, um, energy advisors, um, solutions for um, um, efficient energy use in, in, in buildings, in households. And it, it is a platform that is, um, you know, before these were just energy advisors, one or two, and, and it's a long way of being able to um, advise 500,000 households. Um, this platform, for example, as just as, 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 as a, uh, an initial uh, pilot, has just been able to reach um, within, within a month time these 500,000 households and provide insights as well as very detailed and sometimes complex ways of, of, um, of addressing uh, energy intensity in, in, in buildings. 
And so, again, I think here, these are the models that um, um, we should be developing further. Um, and, and I think that is also happening. And that is then where it comes also to, to um, where, where that is the value, again, of AI and where I think will help to um, overcome those that are um, still afraid of it or, or, or um, are um, um, reactive to it. So, yeah. thank you. Rit, what do you, what's one issue New York faces? Um, well, uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll say this is a complex city and I think our biggest challenge is, is that it is tough to get stuff done. Right. And, and that stems from all the competing priorities and the competing fears, not even within government, but just, you know, I, I mean, I think about, I, I was doing a talk yesterday around clean energy. You know, one of the things New York City did, and, and I think is a fantastic thing, we made the commitment to uh, spend, to basically un enter into a 20 year contract to purchase clean energy. And that became the anchor customer that allowed the financing to go through for the uh, Champlain Hudson Power Express, Chippy, which is gonna bring a gigawatt of hydropower directly into New York City. That's great. We now have to figure out how to permit it, right? And the question of where you're going to lay cables, are you gonna go through a low income neighborhood? Or are you gonna go through a park? You might need the state legislature to, to change the law if you're gonna go through a park. Like honestly, that blocking and tackling of how you actually deliver these things is the problem. Uh, it, is, it is also the cause for why the costs are so high, right? Um, and I don't know what the solution is in terms of how you apply AI to that, but uh, you know, I spent five years at, at Sidewalk Labs, and so I'm quite familiar with the challenge of how you apply technology to cities and to governments, and also where the pitfalls of, of that effort are. But that is the crux of the matter. And you know, thinking about what Gina was just saying, I mean, he was talking about Stockholm. One of my key observations: you look at the world, uh, you look at cities, you rank them on what progress they're actually making, whether it's climate mitigation or climate adaptation, right? Put them in, in rank, not order of how much the mayor is committed, how thoughtful they are, what their rhetoric is, how much progress they've actually made. It's going to be the same list as how clean the streets are or how honest the police force is or whatever. Why is it that you've always got Copenhagen and Stockholm and Singapore at the top and a close second is going to be London, New York, and it's it's all the usual suspects, because it's about how effective government is. It's the the topic is I think a a detail to a certain extent extent. So I think it is fantastic, and I do not mean at all to suggest that the the scientific work on where the problems are and what we need to do about them are not important. As I say, I use that that every day, or and I'm I'm tremendously grateful for it. I. I'm very proud of the fact the NPCC came out of the first Plan YC, and, and it was a key piece of New York City's intellectual and, and policy infrastructure. But our challenge now is how do we deliver the climate action? It's not really about what that climate action is. Thank you, Rick. Jaya, you get the last on this, and, and we do have time for a couple questions, I think, right? I'm looking to somebody to confirm or deny that. But. <laughs> Um, all right, so I think, I mean, really three and very interrelated things, right? So on the one hand, I mean, if uh, people here have looked at the Stockholm Institute report that came out on planetary boundaries, right? We're talking about climate change being one of the nine, right? And a lot of the others, ocean acidification, and if you're looking at land systems change, a lot of it um, is a consequence of human behavior consumption patterns. Right. So there is the human consumption, uh, you know, that we need to look at very closely. Uh, what are we consuming? How is it being produced? The supply chains, um, you know, and, and basically looking at how can we do better at building um, a repair economy, looking at circularity, especially as we go into new tech solutions like EVs and, you know, which is going to or is already kind of creating conversations around critical minerals and things of that nature. So I think one part of this is definitely how can we use tech to, you know, drive better behavior uh, changes and behavior shifts 
basically showing you your bill, showing you your neighbor's bills on electricity consumption to say, hey, you can do better, giving you some tips, etc. That's one. The second thing that uh, I think is that there is a real lack of evidence, and that is why a lot of the financing is not going towards adaptation solution. Financing is the second big thing, in my opinion. Um, there is lack of evidence of the alternatives. Uh, mitigation is easy because you know you can productize the solutions. You can create clear, you know, uh, sort of a, a sense of these are the benefits that can come out of it. You can project uh, and give very relevant numbers. Adaptation is hard that way. So how do you create the evidence for that um, and and create the data to be able to say that this deserves finance? Where does that finance come from? And then how do you attract private sector finance, especially into this conversation? The third to me most importantly is it would be an utter waste of money if you can just if you just put tech and you know in terms of governance agency interagency cooperation does not exist right uh, because you can put the tech there and and one agency can you know benefit from it in the short term but unless you can drive coordinated efforts which is what is needed right now multidisciplinary action and coordinated efforts all of that tech is going to waste. So I think we need very strong, robust systems of governance to incentivize city leaders, mayors, to invest in all of this, to kind of take, you know, to be able to take stock and, and deliver on some of the things that we're looking for. Fantastic. And I, I would just say that I think OL, the Office of Long-Term Planning uh, and Sustainability that Rhett established uh, in New York City was a good example of that interagency framing that you're talking about. Um, do we have perhaps one or two questions, or Josh is going to tell me I don't have time for them? No, we definitely have time for questions. Um, we are running a little bit short on mics, so we're going to borrow a couple of mics from the panel and bring them into the audience. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand, and we will try and get to as many as possible. Looks like we've already got one. Hi there. Uh, so thanks to the panelists and presenters uh, for their talks. Um, I was just wondering, uh, this is an event for AI and climate, considering the environment. Uh, no one's mentioned anything about the environmental impact of AI and these technologies. And I'm just wondering your thinking on it. Is this something that's just, you know, whatever happens will happen? Is it something that you see as something to be reckoned with, um, if anyone wants to speak to that? It's a great question. It's a question that's come up a lot this week in terms of the, the R&D that's necessary to try and mitigate and reduce the carbon uh, uh, footprint of training these models. And I think there's also the flip side to that where AI can be really helpful in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll, I'll give you one example that came out recently from a research team at Google um, that focused on contrails. Uh, so contrails are the, the, the white clouds that you'll see uh, off in the sky when, uh, when a plane is flying over. Uh, and what they train a machine, mo a machine learning model to do is try and predict flight plans uh, for pilots that can reduce contrails, which are huge, uh, huge uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, emitters. Uh, and what they did was with some, with some travel optimization, they increased gas by uh, 0.2 percent, but were able to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of that flight by over 50 percent. Um, so yes, there needs to be work and research and development to help improve uh the the carbon intensity of the training of these systems but at the same time there's also a tremendous opportunity to help reduce the greenhouse gas emissions using ai uh, uh on things like uh, like aviation thank you um uh, i have a a question of how we bring um all these fantastic um ai driven solutions to a variety of communities um, especially non big city communities like New York City has impressive infrastructure uh, to handle all sorts of data coming in. Uh, but you start going to small and medium sized cities, sometimes they'll have a single planner that will be working uh, on basically everything that that particular county or city is working in. They probably don't have the capacity to deal with a sudden influx of data and we're experiencing this as in the Virginia Climate Center, uh, trying to blink bring climate data to people uh, in more rural communities. And I'm very curious what the panel thinks um, are some of the gaps we need to fill uh, and how we can go about that uh, to bring uh, this technology and, and the solutions that can enable to all these kind of 
other size communities. I, I can start, and, or do you want to start? I, yeah. uh, sure, I mean, and, and just to say that, yes, absolutely, and this is exactly the kind of challenges that we faced in, you know, in Indian cities as well. I think one of the very successful examples of, that you mentioned about the digital public infrastructure, right, and that, for example, India has seen one of the most successful deployments of that technology uh, when it came to, you know, you know, during the times of COVID, you know, directing sort of targeted um, uh, social schemes at people, or, you know, in terms of also using it as early warning systems for evacuations and, and things of that nature. So I think one is that, you know, if we can work more around sort of the, the digital public infrastructure and look at how we can use mobile phone access, right, which most people have in this day and age uh, to kind of do the warning systems, to kind of do early warning, uh, you know, systems which are targeted, We've done that for farming communities, for example, in India, um, before you know a climate event to let them know that their their you know their agricultural produce or crops might be stressed. So I think one is that you know investing in sort of DPI and looking at how that can be used for multi-purpose uh, sort of framing is is one of the things that we can look at. And I think in terms of capacity, that one planner in a town that's all too common, right? Um, I think that is exactly where tech can step in because. You know, tech is an enabler, right? It's not the it's not the end; it's the means to an end, and that is exactly where technology and its sort of multiplier effect can come in, where you can use it. You can use mobile phones, and you know that kind of a technology to capacitate people for outreach, for dissemination, for a lot of things that previously were actually very hard to do. Can I add to that? To to build on what I was saying, and also to to build on on some stuff that Evan had uh, mentioned in his presentation. I think the barriers to entry of, of, of being able to use these tools has gone down dramatically. Caitlin uh, Augusty from Datakind is in the crowd, uh, and she's been a strong proponent of no code and low code entry points into some of these powerful solutions. And I think uh, the, the, the one thing that we often do and everything that we support has to be open source and it's publicly available. One, to make sure that others can benefit from the outputs of that, of that capital, uh, but then also so that you can build on the code bases that others have built. Um, so instead of reinventing the wheel or spending a lot of that upfront fixed cost trying to do that, you can then take it to the next level. Um, two platforms for any audiences that wanna, anyone in the audience that wants to play around with. Uh, Google has an environmental insights explorer that's really, really helpful, just publicly available uh, to, to anyone that wants to understand uh, the, the, say the, the solar potential of a particular city where that's available. But what just launched this uh, week, there's a, there's a platform, uh, an initiative that I think is a game changer. It's called Data Commons. Um, and we just launched a, a, a long collaboration with the UN Statistics Department to bring a lot of the SDG data into the commons. So now to show you how the barriers to entry have gone down, because of natural language and large language models, you can now just type in your natural language and query this database and say, tell me about poverty in Latin America. And it'll automatically pull from these authoritative data sets that are standardized and in this database. And then you can just talk to it and say, how does that correlate with uh, gender inequality and food insecurity? And then it automatically starts to pull out some of these insights. So as Evan was saying, just like the cutting the time to insights and then cutting the time to action is critical. What we learn from our grantees is that they're, once they start to use AI into their operational flows, they're able to achieve their outcomes in a third of the time and half the cost. And knowing where we are on the sustainable development goals, where we're so far off track, that's the accelerant that we need to catch up if we have any chance of meeting those goals by 2030. Hi, thanks. Great panel. Um, one of the challenges we still have is demonstrating that the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action. Um, we kind of understand it qualitatively, but, but proving it um, in a quantitative way that builds into those financial cases seems to be quite difficult. The economic models we have are, are not sophisticated enough to capture what's likely to be happening over the next decade. Do you have any examples of um, where AI is being used to um, understand those cascading effects, those feedback loops in a way which kind of quantifies the financial case for you and gets th that sense of urgency across? Thanks. I could be a little bit flippant. We might not know, but all the insurance companies that are pulling out of Florida and 
California may already have done that. Right. No, just to say that that is the part that is the missing part right the evidence of the cost of inaction versus the cost of uh, action we did a little exercise in the southern city of Cochin India where we said, you know, what is the extent of the vulnerability and the underserved in the city, you know, and looking at each of the individual sort of climate hazards, whether it's heat or flood or landslides. And when we brought that together, uh, an astonishing third of the city was vulnerable to multiple climate hazards, right? Um, and then when you kind of go on the ground and look at the kinds of settlements and the places in which they live, it's no surprise. But being able to spatialize that data, uh, you know, and to be able to see uh, where that exists, gave that basically cut the time for, you know, response in terms of the insights that were needed, the actions that would follow. And once you had that in place, it was very easy to build the story of, you know, the loss and damage that existed from sort of previous years when flooding had occurred uh, to the decrease in loss and damage that the city might experience if you put into place certain types of solutions like nature based solutions and so on. So once you identified the pockets within the community which would be the most impacted, it was an easier uh, way to get to the reduction in loss and damage that these communities would experience if certain uh, protocols were put in place. So that was just a small exercise. I just want to uh, just as a take up one moderators uh, privilege on this because this really fantastic question. I think there's a there's an information gap, though, at the spatial distribution of the question right so understanding the cost of inaction and or the benefits of action. Across a city a municipality an industry is one thing understanding how that plays out at the individual level the building owner level, we have these challenges in New York with our local laws, how do you push forward initiatives that have real cost though that cost will ultimately be paid back um, when it plays out at the individual level. And I think AI could perhaps be quite valuable in this, this question. But I don't think we have that information. I don't know. You may have come across some of this with local. No, but I, you know, I, I think what uh, the example that, that Gino mentioned, uh, you know, anything, and, and this may get a, a bit farther afield from, from the actual question around uh, kind of at an analytical level, but you know exactly to your point Joel what's so powerful is when you can get down to the individual um you know recommendation level right because it it is not useful advice to say protect yourself against climate change it is not useful advice to say green your building right that's not actionable what's actionable is when you have a tailored set of things that you can in fact do coupled with an assessment of why you need to do that. One of the examples, for, you know, what a direct application of the work that uh, Timon and his team have contributed to, we issued these rainfall ready maps at DEP uh, a year ago, which is actually not about climate change, it's about current flood uh, vulnerability. We identified the 1600 most likely to flood parcels around the city that were residential, and we proactively reached out to them to offer them flood barriers. Now, is that a long term solution? Of course not. But it's a stopgap because, as I said, it's going to take us years to figure out exactly and, and more importantly, how to deliver the, the infrastructure solution. But those people are at risk today. OK. Uh, we are over time, so I do think we're going to have to cap it there, but please join me in giving a huge round of applause to our amazing panel and to also the showcase presentations. There's going to be uh, some networking and some food and drinks outside, so I think if you just go outside the auditorium and downstairs, um, we will have a chance to connect with each other. But again, thank you all so much for coming, both the people that are here in person and also those that are on the live stream. I think it was a fantastic presentations that we got from WRI and New School and fantastic discussions on the panel. So thank you all so much for joining us and we'll see you outside. Thank you. <laughs>